Welcome to The Teacher's Story. I'm Jackie Scully. This is a podcast to elevate teacher voice. In this program, you will hear teachers sharing their journey into this profession and their ideas for education. I'm kicking it off Teacher Appreciation Week, which starts May 2nd. This is about honest, vulnerable, inspiring storytelling. It's a time and a space for teachers to share their ideas for the future of education. Teachers are beautiful beings who give their heart and soul to their community. They're innovators, they're inspirational, not only to children, but to the people around them. And they deserve to share their voice. So welcome to the teacher's story, enjoy. Hi, welcome to the teacher's story. I'm Jackie Scully, and today we have Ryan Judd with us. And Ryan is an internationally known music therapist, billboard chart topping recording artist, and child light yoga and mindfulness for diverse abilities instructor, as well as he has a new development for an app called Cool Koala, which will be out on Alexa skill, uh, used interactively with Echo. I am so excited for him to talk about that towards the uh, end of our interview when we talk about kind of his new developments. This is really exciting. This is a very different type of uh, conversation about education. And I think some of the ideas that we'll share towards the end about mindfulness in the classroom will be really enlightening. Um, so thank you so much, Ryan, for being on the show. Oh, you're welcome. It's an honor to be here. So my first question for you is, what was your inspiration to get in the work that you're doing, either with music therapy, but then eventually also working with children with mindfulness and your music? Yeah, I always loved working with kids. You know, that was always my job, whether I was a babysitter or a camp counselor, that was just my thing. So I love being a kid myself, right? And it like lets me be silly and fun and 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 make a positive impact on a child's life. So I decided to do my undergrad in psychology and I focused on child development. And then I graduated and I knew I wanted to move on to graduate school, but I just wasn't sure what to specialize in. And at that time, I was a budding musician. I found this style of music that just lightened up my soul. And I just mm. knew like, wow, I, this is going to be a part of my life's path. So I was becoming very passionate about music. And I was really getting into Eastern arts at that time different mindfulness practices. And I found this amazing graduate school in Boulder, Colorado called Naropa University. And Naropa University had a music therapy program. And I was like, what, what is music therapy all about? I, I haven't really heard of music therapy. Um, so I looked into it and it was just the perfect fit because it combined my passion for music with my love of working with children. And this school, Naropa, was founded by a Buddhist monk back in the 60s, and it has this curriculum of mindfulness throughout it. So it was just the perfect fit for me. Now, here's the interesting thing. I had never worked with kids with special needs. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, back in the day when I went to middle school, high school, and went to school, you really didn't see the kids with special needs so um, and diverse abilities. So I just hadn't had much experience until my internship, which was at the local hospital, and there was a pediatric rehabilitation unit. So there I was working with all these amazing kids mm -hmm. with special needs, diverse abilities, a lot of kids on the autism spectrum. And oh, wow, it was just I had found my home, you know, mm -hmm. and that was what I knew I wanted to do from then on out. So I graduated with a master's degree in counseling psychology and music therapy and immediately started a private practice focusing on providing music therapy for kids with special needs. Ah, oh, I love it. Just so yeah. many different uh, parts of your story. And I think why we initially connect it, you know, I teach psychology, um, I'm also married to a musician. Nice. Um, I, I love the whole concept of this university founded by, you know, among like Buddhist monks and having the whole kind of like Eastern influence of mindfulness. And I think especially at the time that you went there, it's kind of like when it was just really getting started. Mm -hmm. And I think we're in a culture now that you're seeing it being fused in the workplace and then hopefully yeah. more in schools. And I think that we're gonna get a lot out of this conversation because we're at this point where we really wanna practice mindfulness like as a whole American society. Yeah. Um, and I just, I love that where I love that you worked with um, kids on the spectrum as well. One yeah. of my first teaching jobs in Hawaii, I had a student who had Asperger's syndrome 
Mm. And he, he also had a life um, teacher, life coach with him in the classroom, but he was just such a bright light. And I was kind of fortunate because he loved history. So, uh. you know, it wasn't the same kind of light maybe in math <laughs> class, but he, and I taught American history and he like knew the con constitution in and out. And I was just like blown away by his intellect and, and just eloquence and speaking about the constitution and about the bill of rights and wow. every interaction I've ever had with children with special needs is just, I don't know, it touches you in a different way. So much to love. There's so much to love about those kids and there's so much to love and learn about like the, the family and the parents and the support systems. And I've just learned so much too from working with other therapists, working with speech therapists and mm -hmm. occupational and physical therapists, special education teachers. That's really been a huge part of my continuing education. Yeah, and I like having you on the show and talking about all of these different types of teachers because I think most people outside of the education industry don't really realize all the specialties out there, like mm -hmm. for different um, you know, jobs in education. Like I know speech therapists right now, that's like a really big field to go into as well. Um, I think you're gonna see an increase, I hope, with counselors in schools and more just mm -hmm. like mental health um, you know, professionals in schools. So kind of leading into my next question, segueing from that, what were some of the, like maybe your early experiences with your practice or working with uh, children with special needs or anything else you wanna go into with your early work experience? Yeah, well, along that, those lines of working with other therapists and teachers, I think one of the pivotal experiences where I blossomed as a music therapist was I was living in Boulder, Colorado at the time, and I was a year or two into my private practice, still green, you know, and still insecure. And uh, <laughs> there was this amazing camp I kept hearing about. Ryan, there's this amazing camp, Adam's camp. It's up on the mountain. You got to go do this. They, they need music therapists, like sign up. And I was like, okay, I'll look into it. And knowing that the model was five therapists, five children, five days. Mm -hmm. So basically there's a team of therapists, art therapists, music therapists, speech therapists, occupational and physical therapists working intensively from 8.30 AM to 2.30 PM every day, which is five kids. Wow. And then and once the parents come to pick up the kids, all you do is sit and plan and talk and discuss and plan for the next day and discuss goals and strategies. I mean, until like 10 o'clock at night, wow. you're, you're like living together with these therapists, basically, yeah. in a, like a little condo. Um, and so but I knew I was going to be kind of center stage and have all these other therapists seeing my work. And I felt insecure because I was a newbie, right? But I finally did it. And that was a game changer. Mm -hmm. Not only was it a game changer because it helped me spread my wings. It helped me realize what I'm doing is so effective and so powerful and so respected by people who had been doing it for 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. Some of the people on my team were people who have been practiced for 25, 30 years. And for them to give me that recognition and give me that support and that praise for what I'm doing and to be able to learn from them and share my own gifts. It was amazing. It was a total game changer for me. I love that. I mean, what a community. I mean, that kind of collaboration and then to have such a small group of students, yeah. uh, you can feel the impact, right? Like you can feel the impact on the students, but you can feel the impact on yourself as you know, um, a music therapist. And I love this whole collaboration with all different types of therapists, the art therapist and, you know, speech therapist and not the same type of community, but I had that feeling of collaboration when I taught in China mm. and it was teachers from England and te teachers uh. from America and then the Chinese teachers and we all worked together. It's the most collaborative effort I've ever been a part of as a teacher and to do that in China as well. And be from so many different backgrounds, but then be on the same page about the goals that we have and how we want to like teach these children and really keep them engaged. Um, that same sense of real community and feedback, like constant feedback. And it does, it grows your confidence and it allows you to feel like this is what I want to be doing. Like it's re like reinforcing that. So I love that sense of community. For sure. For sure. I feel like yeah, it takes a village to raise a child and it, it takes so many people with consistency. That's the thing that I really love too. I mean, I, I've worked in the school systems for 22 years and it's hard. It's hard to have those 
deep connections with other team members and to really consult and make sure everyone's on the same page with the goals they're addressing and how they're addressing the goals and hey what's working for you and what's working and what's not i mean we all make an effort and it happens but when you're spending four or five hours a night <laughs> with a team and all you're doing is talking about five kids, magic happens. And uh, we just saw some amazing, amazing progress. And for every year I do it, I did it for 10 or, 10 or 15 years. And hmm. every, every year I did it, I thought, are we really going to see a change in five days? I mean, is that realistic? Are we, are, are we kidding ourselves here? But man, then there would be breakthroughs and it would just be like, wow. No, that's that's not a coincidence. <laughs> that is a direct result of this intensive model. So it was really beautiful. Yeah, and I think there's something to take away from that and kind of leading into our next part with the talking about the pandemic is there needs to be the time and the space for professionals to really gather and mm. share their ideas. I think mm. what I love about being a teacher and just being in the education industry is the collaboration. And we kind of, we lost that in the pandemic mm. because we were isolated, right? We were on virtual or hybrid. I felt more on an island than ever yeah. in these last two years. And that's no, that's really no one's fault. It's just what happened and we just survived. Yep. And I think uh, there's a yearning now to be, can we get back to that collaboration? So like we have a new schedule this year at my school and we do have that time built into the nice. day. So I'm so excited about that. I'm re really happy to gather again as a department or even like in our department. I'd love to work with other teachers in the English department and science and teaching psychology. I feel like I can collaborate with almost any subject matter. Um, but it, it is important to have that time and to create that space. And I think that needs to happen in a lot of places um, in schools around the country because they lost that during the pandemic. So kind of leading into... Um, that next next topic, what has the pandemic shown you as far as obviously challenges, and this could be with education or just the work that you do all around as a music therapist, um, or maybe this was like the time that kind of like birthed this new, you know, development that you're working on the Cool Koala app. Um, so challenges, aha moments, any takeaways from the last couple of years? Oh, so many. Wow. Well, first of all, I just want to say too, not only is there that collaboration and that sharing of ideas, but let's let's face it, there's accountability. You know, when you're sitting in a team meeting and you say, okay, I'm going to follow up and do this. And there's this team and it's again written down in the notes and the parents are listening. You know, it, it keeps you accountable. It's a little extra drive, a little extra motivation. So I think that was something that got lost in the pandemic. And yeah. certainly we saw it with our own child who has ADHD and anxiety. Anxiety. And we, we saw the school slipping on a couple of things and we were forgiving because come on, every, it had to be forgiving. But now that school's back in session, mm -hmm. we're like, okay, people, <laughs> uh, vacation time's over. Not like it was a vacation, yeah. but you know, the time to be isolated is over. Let's really get right. back on this plan. So there's mm -hmm. that accountability. But in terms of my music therapy work, wow, I, I go into remote. I was like, how is this going to work? Mm -hmm. I thought it was going to flop, but I'm like, okay, I, I joined in with my music therapy colleagues. You know, luckily we had, there was a couple of people who really took a leadership role and did Zoom calls and opened it up to any music therapist and everyone jumped on and shared, you know, even from technology, like what mics are you using? How are you dealing with the latency? You know, the, the time difference where you're playing or they're playing a note and you hear it a couple seconds later mm -hmm. and just all these things. And it just was so helpful. And I just said, well, I got to try it. And I tried it and I could not believe how effective it was. Mm. Um, my clients, all but one, I said there was one client and he, he's nonverbal and he just, mm. he had a really, really hard time with it. So other than that one client, oh my God, my other clients did so well, just as good. And sometimes maybe even a little better depending on the activity and the intervention. So that was amazing. And all the mindfulness and all mm. the deep breathing and relaxation songs and focused listening activities and seated yoga that we were doing worked just as well remotely. So I was so, so very happy about that. Mm -hmm. And just to kind of um, kind of share some of my takeaways too, from just being virtual teaching, but that same aspect, 
some students really shined and not saying we mm -hmm, want to go back to mm -hmm. virtual, but there were students who are maybe the quiet students in class, a little bit more reserved, yep. and they just shared so much, not necessarily maybe on screen, but when we would do like um, a discussion board online uh, or they're writing in their journals, their online journals, like they were just going deeper and deeper. Yeah. And I felt like, especially at the height, like March, 2020 into like the fall, there was this sense of students and teachers too, like really co-creating and having these very deep connections and conversations I, I'm like, I've never experienced like that level of depth before, like mm. in the classroom. And it was mm. just online or hybrid. Yeah. And it was still clunky. And there were definitely <laughs> students, like you said, you had the one, there's definitely students that are like, this is not working for me at yep. all. Yep. But it was just, it was amazing to see how things could really work. And in some cases for some students, even better. And let's talk about that a little bit. So I've been thinking about that. I think a part of that, not the complete picture, but certainly a part of that, I assume that the kids who get anxious and nervous, insecure in the classroom setting with all these other peers who might have more energy and be louder and, you know, more gregarious and extroverted, those could be the ones that like shined more with the virtual stuff because they're in the comfort of their home and they don't feel all these eyes on them and there's not all these other bodies and all this intense energy around them so i think it goes back to the point that one of the things we learned in the pandemic is that anxiety is such a critical piece to address in the mm -hmm. learning process because who can learn anything or remember anything or share anything effectively when they're feeling anxious and nervous you know what i'm saying yeah absolutely and i think kind of going into our part about like ideas for our education reform or what we can do in the classroom to come out of this pandemic and take some of that with us so i see this next year years to come as how do how do we bring what we were doing before the pandemic but what our highlights were together yeah. and then really make it a priority to focus on mental health and especially like when you talk about anxiety i was a student that had a lot of anxiety in school mm -hmm. i would stay home sick because i was legitimate sick i had stomach issues because of my anxiety wow and we weren't addressing the anxiety or just like, well, you're sick, stay home, take some medicine, you know, um, eat some chicken noodle soup, right? And okay. it was never talked about. And I was that same way. Like I'd be in a rambunctious classroom with like all of these students have big personalities and I was very quiet mm. um, and introverted in high school. And I was intimidated. Like I was intimidated to go to school. Like if this, if this existed, at least for a period of time, I probably would have been that student on Zoom or, you know, like writing, like, this is my thing, you know, I just want to keep doing this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, we do need to um, make that a priority and address that. And like, what can we now bring into the classroom or bring into schools to make sure we are, you know, helping those students that have anxiety or that are feeling like they can't speak up or advocate for themselves. So kind of moving into my next question is like, what do you see as uh, the changes that we can make and like, how can we really fully serve our, our students? Yeah, I just feel like there needs to be more mindfulness, more moments of silence, more moments of inner work, inner reflection, developing those inner resources, you know, that are going to serve these children for life. So important to teach kids about developing compassion, gratitude, mm -hmm. and using deep breath to calm the body in the correct way, using body relaxation skills, knowing how to let go of worries, knowing how to deal with frustration and anger. And this social emotional mm -hmm. curriculum should really be the stronger part. And I know it's tricky. I know there's so many subjects to cover and everything, but I really feel like the pandemic showed us that too, with kids mm -hmm. being out of their peer groups and not having the chance to naturally learn some of these skills and naturally practice some of these skills. There was a regression and obviously there was heightened anxiety. And so it really brings us back to the point of, okay, we need more social emotional learning and even regular education teachers need a couple simple things that they can do 
you know, something that'll start with 30 seconds or a minute, you know, it could even be as simple as here's a little um, chime bell by Woodstock chimes, um, which they, they have a really nice tone. You might not hear it as well over here, but you know, something I do with my clients, just a little focus listening, a little kind of way to just practice impulse control to get a little more internal and to be mindful. It's just to listen to this. So I'll do something like starting in silence, nice deep breath. Listening to the chime until it goes into silence. All right. Now we're ready to learn. <laughs> I love it. I love um, so, you know, obviously I, I tend to make things sing songy, but certainly you could just say, all right, we're going to listen to the sound of the chime bell until it fades into silence. And if, you know, if in the middle of that, there's a couple of kids that chatter and something, okay, let's try that again. And we really, everyone's going to be silent until we can, you know, listen to the chime bell fade out into silence. So something like that, something like some simple seated yoga, you know, even like a candle pose where you're sitting and you inhale and you raise your hands above your head, reach for the ceiling exhale your arms come down like wings you know do that three or four times some there's some basic seated yoga that i use with my clients that especially when you partner the breath with it that can be huge if you have time to do a guided meditation great and i know so you know a lot of teachers are like hey i'm not really comfortable with leading a guided meditation i'm not sure about that there's so many resources out there that can be used where you could just, you know, pull it up on your iPhone, put it up on the smart board, whatever, and do a short one to two minute guided relaxation. I'm not saying you need to do a 15, 20 minute. I know that your time is of F's essence, but even just one or two minutes to settle the sensory system, to settle the body, to settle the mind so that the children are ready to learn and to honor those kids who are a bit, a bit more introverted and a bit more quiet to give them that space where they're like, oh my God, this feels like home. And now I can relax. And this is energizing for me. Now I can be ready to deal with a little bit more of the chaos of the classroom. Yeah. And we talked about this when we met before that a lot of schedules, there's like maybe five minutes to get to your next class. And I know that what we really enjoyed when we went virtual and hybrid because we had to build in more time because you have children on screens all day long when they were yeah. virtual or they were hybrid at home. So we built in 20 minutes, mm -hmm. not saying that we were gonna keep that forever, but we <laughs> loved it. Like the teachers loved it because yeah. we also need time to settle into the next class. And like many teachers will have varying grade levels and subjects you can go from like I know some in my department have middle and upper school. They can go from sixth grade to ninth grade or eighth grade to 12th, back to back, totally wow. different subjects. And it's like, how do you also get yourself ready for that switch in five minutes? Um, so I, it would be great to have this like school culture. And it's something I want to practice, at least in my class. And maybe I'll just bring that up to my department of when the students come in class to do something that's only going to be like a minute, you know, whatever that may be. I love the idea of using sensory because I think yeah. sometimes just sitting in silence and saying, well, we're going to meditate. It's very hard for students to get into oh, yeah, that yeah, space. Yeah. And I'm at a Quaker school and we do meeting for worship, but yeah. it's like still very difficult for students. But if you have like a bell or I thought like a singing bowl, or you can do a guided meditation, like you can find a bunch on YouTube oh, totally. um, in a couple minutes or just some really ambient nature sounds or music. Yep. And I did this one time, it was a little bit longer, it might have been like 10 minutes. So again, that's not that long. But for teenagers, that's pretty long. Um, in my psychology class, because we were talking about meditation. So I did that as just part of a lesson. And not for everyone, but there were many students that are like, Oh, I just needed that. Yeah. Like, thank you. And you imagine yeah. if you did that in small pieces, every single day, yep. you know, for every class, if you could make it a school culture, Yep. That could just totally change the way students learn, how they engage. It just helps your nervous system. Um, I also did like a meditation or like a mindfulness journal 
-hmm. at the end of last year. And they loved it. Like we went outside. I said, just walk around in nature for like 10 minutes and don't write anything yet. And then sit down and for another 10 minutes, write in your journal about anything that was a sensory experience or anything that popped into your mind. And I had many students are like, I just have never done that before. Yeah, and I'm yeah. so glad we did that. And I gave them journals and there was, they're so like programmed. There was this one student who gave it back to me, like to turn it in like a homework, like an assignment. I was like, no, no, that's for you to keep. He's like, oh, really? I'm like, yeah, that's yours. You can use it however you want now. And he's like, oh, okay. You almost have to like read, like train them, you know? Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. And even the kids who you might not see a visible effect, it's sinking in, it's sinking in on, on one level or another. And I, I think kind of going back to the teachers too, this is just as much for the teachers as it is for the kids. Yeah. I mean, imagine as a teacher having the first one or two minutes of every class being this regrounding, recentering, more peaceful experience. I think it's really beautiful. And along those lines too, though, the teacher really needs to believe in it. They need to mm -hmm. embrace it and embody it. You know, it can't be like telling the students it's more like we're doing this together. Mm -hmm. This has been really, I've found this really effective for me. So whether that's a guide meditation or a breathing app or a focused listening, um, a particular breathing technique with a visual, like one of those fun Hoberman spheres that kind of expand uh, yeah. and shrink. Those yeah. are always really cool. I think that the teachers really got to own that and embody that um, mm -hmm. so that they're benefiting as well. And that, and the students can see like, oh, okay, this is, this is working for them too. Yeah. And that just got me thinking about um, if you want to make it a school culture, besides maybe a couple of teachers who, I know a couple of teachers already who do a little bit of like the uh, seated yoga in yeah, their classes. Yeah, there you go. So it does happen, but you could have like professional development in the beginning of the school year. Like we have opening meetings before school starts with the students and say, we really want to work on mindfulness, you know, because we see that students really need that, but we need that as well. And it helps to kind of center us before class starts when you're moving so quickly. Um, I think if you made it like a training where you brought an expert in, and then gave the tools to the teachers and kind of got them practicing with each other. And then they felt more comfortable in it. And then maybe that they also know it's a whole school initiative that we're all doing this together. You probably would see more, maybe more buy-in and maybe more comfortability from teachers um, because it is still a very, I think, not um, sought out practice in the classroom mm -hmm. for many teachers. And I would say like at my school, we have a lot of like younger teachers. So I think they would be like right on board because they're kind of in that Gen Z, the, you know, late, later millennial that are like all about mindfulness. But yeah. we do have quite a bit of like middle-aged and older faculty as well. And I think that that's where you would probably want some kind of training. Um, now I'm like having these ideas of going to my administration <laughs> and be like, hey, could we do a training on mindfulness and how maybe we can make this part of like everyone's class? <laughs> For sure. I love, I love that. that. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. Because yeah, just to tell someone, hey, here's one resource and you know, it's a dive deep and really have a longer presentation with a nice resource list. And you're right to have the teachers practice with each other, um, I think would be huge in helping teachers feel more comfortable in introducing yeah. it. And again, owning it, a feeling, feeling the effect of it themselves before they share it with others is going to be so essential to that working. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll have to bring that up to my head of school. We'll see what happens. Um, so my last part that I want to uh, have you share with all of the listeners is the work you're doing now. Really exciting with this new app called Cool Koala. And I think it's also a great place to talk about the really young children and yeah. starting this type of work when they're like, even five years old, because yeah. then it becomes part of who they are. So would you love to share about your new development with that? Well, it all did come together during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I had a colleague of mine who has made some different parenting apps and he licensed some of my sleep music. I did a couple albums of sleep music for children and all research based, you know, 60 beats per minute, that resting heart rate, 
very consistent, nice long tracks. So your central nervous system can really sink into the rhythm. There's this beautiful ocean background that even goes between tracks. So there's no silence to awaken the neurological system. Mm -hmm. So he had licensed some of that music for an app. And then he reached out to me during the pandemic because I had created a couple guided meditations um, for kids and I posted them on YouTube and his kids love them. And he's like, we got to, we got to do an app of this. This is so needed, you know, mm -hmm. with these anxiety mm -hmm. levels increasing and with your skills in music and mindfulness and putting together these guided meditations, we need to do this. And I, I just kind of jumped in it and started writing and recording and learning and oh, it's was, it was really a beautiful process i loved it i loved it because it allowed me to tap into a different part of my creativity and imagination mm -hmm. and i have a four-year-old and a seven-year-old so it's just perfect because my mind is thinking about that stuff and reading those books and thinking about those characters and doing those voices and everything so it was really cool and to really hone it into those themes that i'm so proud of a, developing compassion and developing gratitude and that deep breath work for relaxation and the body relaxation and dealing with anger and frustration, letting go of worries and self-empowerment and self-love. There's a th one of those themes for each day. And mm. then the next week, you know, it'll be a different meditation, but still along those daily themes. And we're just hearing from so many parents that it's helping so much with their bedtime. Like at first we didn't re we didn't release it as a bedtime app mm -hmm. or a bedtime Alexa skill. It's both as an iOS app for apples and as an Alexa skill for like echo speakers for our Amazon echo speakers. But, um, but we, then we started getting all this feedback that parents were doing this at bedtime. And then it was just like, of course, <laughs> when else is a child in that like yeah. receptive, quiet space? And I know bedtimes can be a little rambunctious too, but you know, that's the pillow talk time. That's the time to settle down and really learn something on a deeper emotional mm -hmm. level. So parents were doing this at bedtime. And not only are these kids learning these lifelong skills, that are really the foundation for happiness and peace, but it's also helping them go to sleep. Mm -hmm. And then what parents were saying is like, oh my God, after you say good night, because the meditations, we keep them pretty short, like five, six minutes. And then I would just say good night and that was it. And then the parents were like, give us a little something, give us some music after this. And we're like, duh, of course, we've got this perfect music. Um, so then we had that sleep music that mm -hmm. I composed and produced. Now follow the meditation. So I've just, I'm so happy about it. I, I really am proud of it. And I think it's going to really help a lot of families and a lot of kids um, with the bedtime ritual and also learning these essential lifelong skills. Yeah. And kind of going back to your um, beginning degree, and I am all about child development. It's one of my favorite things to teach in the psychology class. And I often have students that get really excited for that because I do a, a case study where they um, interview and kind of like observe someone in their life. And then they tie it to different stages of development. But this is such a good thing to start at a young age because yeah. you are, they're being conditioned into how they can relax their body, how they can get ready for bed and they can take that with them. So even if the app's just for children, when they get to be preteen and their teenage years, and then there's other apps out there too, like Calm and- Totally, Headspace, Headspace yeah, yeah. All those other ones or they can go out and find maybe their own kind of meditation music. It becomes part of who they are. And, you know, that's why also like you do anything when they're little, like I think having different languages in the elementary school is really yeah, important. Like we're going to start go. a Spanish program because they're just, they're like sponges. They just take it all in. But then yeah. I love this idea of um, they're doing this before bed to help them to sleep. But think about just like, you know, brain science, right? You're yeah. doing this. And then you are going to sleep and during that time mm -hmm. of like those stages you go through, like your brain, right, mm -hmm. is going to be rewiring all of that. So you're literally transforming your brain too. And it's like sinking in with this meditation. I think it's brilliant. 
such positivity and goodness that's beautiful you know it's funny i have not thought about that yet but of course like i remember back in the days the last thing that you study if you study in bed until you fall asleep mm -hmm. and it's that information that the next day you're just like oh i remember all that all those flashcards, everything so mm -hmm. i think one fun thing too is i of course i dove really deep into kids guided meditations and read all sorts of books and listened to podcasts and did hundreds of these meditations and most of them are pretty cool, but I think a lot of them miss the mark in terms of being really child friendly, mm -hmm. you know, and so I wanted to make mine fun and motivating right so I came up with this whole host of characters there's worried walrus and there's cranky cat and there's busy beaver and they all like symbolize something right. Mm -hmm. uh, worried walrus right, of course anxiety anxiety mm -hmm. and worry and you know he'll come and there'll be this conversation between me and cool koala and worried walrus like as an introduction to the to the meditation and i'll ask worried walrus how he's doing and oh I feel kind of worried today and you know we'll go into this little conversation and then we'll do the oh well i've got the perfect meditation for you today worried walrus um, i think you're really gonna love this and busy mm -hmm. beaver hello adhd like you know mm -hmm. i'm living it so like it's just it was so fun to create a character who's very positive and like gets it done and but has so much energy and just has a tough time slowing things down a little bit and then there's cranky cat you know whose hackles are always up and just you know frustrated and mm -hmm. and annoyed and sometimes angry and so mm -hmm. it just gave this fun kid friendly mm -hmm. foundation to lead into the meditation and then the meditations you know they're so imaginative and story like and again mm. being a dad it was just that is in my soul right now these beautiful children's stories that i love to read and to have the opportunity to try to create some of this imaginative interesting engaging motivating stories was really mm. a gift yeah and i remember you talked about before the was it a worry uh, box yeah <laughs> i love this like visual of taking your worries before bed and not saying like you ignore them but you're trying to get ready to sleep and you can kind of come back to that you know in the morning or later but you put it somewhere totally. that's very i think that's like a really great tactic for kids whereas when you become older we talk about like maybe journaling before bed like get those yeah. worries get or get out. those ideas out on paper, it's yep. out of your mind. Yep. And then you go to bed and usually you can come back to that with fresh eyes the next morning or the next day. And it doesn't feel as much of a weight because you kind of removed it from you already. But this idea with kids of like, we're just going to put that in a box, yeah. you know, and you don't need to think about that right now. We're going to think about, you know, this story and meditation. So yeah, we're, we're going to be present. We're going to take our worry yeah. thoughts and we'll deal with that later. There's, there's a time and place to deal with these worries. Um, and it's not right before bedtime. <laughs> yeah. um, that's for sure. And I, what I think is really cool too, is these skills, like this is for the parents too. If the parents mm. laying in bed with their child, listening to these, mm. these are skills for adults. You know, these are skills that I use. And, and I just want to give a quick shout out to Don Hebner. She's this amazing author, has written so many amazing books about worry, how to deal with worry. Here's one, um, what to do when your temper flares, a kid's guide to overcoming problems with anger. Mm -hmm. she, and she's a PhD. She lives in my town, which was cool. an amazing, wow. bless blessful experience to be able to sit down with her and collaborate with her on this project and she just has written so many amazing beautiful super fun super engaging books about mm -hmm. dealing with worry and anger and all that stuff so uh shout out to don Hebner for the worry box idea because i took that um from her one of her amazing books and i got permission <laughs> i was like don <laughs> is it cool if i like do a guided meditation with the worry box she said, yeah people do that all the time go for it it'd be an honor <laughs> wonderful yeah. Well, um, where can people find you? Or you want to give any of your more information about the, the app, the Cool Koala or any other websites or you know, anything that people can look up about you? And I'll plug that in the show notes as well. Yeah, well, for, I, I've got, yeah, I wear a couple different interrelated hats. So let's talk music therapy. If you want to see some cool videos of me actually doing music therapy and doing these anxiety reduction and deep breath work with my clients you can check out the rhythmtree.com and uh, i've got a bunch of videos i've got a little video blog on there so um, you can check that out my music i do a lot of calming finger style instrumental guitar work and that's at ryanjudmusic.com if you're looking for some calming music 
and for cool koala you know we're at coolkoala.co and of course you know facebook cool koala bedtime instagram cool koala bedtime we're working on our youtube channel getting some helpful videos mm -hmm. where i'm going to be sharing lots of great tips that parents and, and teachers can do with kids in terms of mindfulness mm -hmm. exercises so there's that too so you can just look us up on youtube just look for a cool koala kids meditation and you'll find us there Thank you so much. And all of that, those links will be in my show notes. I have really enjoyed this conversation today, Ryan, and you're just doing such great work. And uh -huh. just in the way that you talk about the work that you do, it's so authentic. Like I can tell you are just very passionate about <laughs> helping kids and yeah. using music and meditation, which is just wonderful. So thank you for the work you're doing. Oh, thanks so much for the opportunity to chat about it. I appreciate it. I love chatting with you.